So what I wanted to, uh, to speak a little about sort of serverless value challenges and, and future from sort of at least uh, uh, our takeaways. I'm, I'm also pretty active in that space, so I'll, I'll try and incorporate some other people's uh, insight into it. So the, the first thing is sort of uh, if, we, if we are looking at the challenges that customers uh, are having today, the main three challenges that uh, customers are facing on the business level is bringing new customers, mainly online customers, because our new buyers are sort of uh, like my daughter is always on the uh, phone, uh, making sure those customers stay and expand and reduce the operational costs. In the case of financial industries, also reducing the, the risk. So the, the things that allow us to, to get there, uh, first is being able to do uh, fast and intelligent data-driven decisions. The second is being able to innovate faster, but not only innovate faster, but also be able to re-innovate and uh, continuously innovate. And the third, build things at scale, because when we, we built an application for internal users and we had a hundred or a thousand of those, we didn't really need elasticity and scalability. Now that we're handling a million customers on an online service, we do need to think about elasticity and in some cases even distribution across multiple uh, geolocation or edges in some cases. So uh, the, the thing that uh, sort of at least on the first bullet that addresses the challenge of, of uh, data is this notion of moving from this data warehousing or interactive, you know, Tableau type of data management into more of an event-driven data processing model. So we're, again, we've talked about it throughout the day. We're getting data, we're contextualizing it. Uh, we're reacting, whether it's for customer recommendations on a website, whether it's to address uh, risk, uh, risk scenarios and fraud detection. So that's uh, what we see, and that fits very well with the serverless uh, notion of event-driven uh, computing. Uh, and essentially moving from a reactive to proactive approach. The second thing, and I copied that slide from uh, Simon Wardley, and that's something called a Wardley map. I don't know if anyone has seen it uh, before. But, but he's speaking about uh, two axes. One axis is sort of the uh, uh, utility. You know, technologies, uh, they sort of come, come to life, and then over time they're becoming sort of commoditized. And then there is sort of the invisible versus vi visible uh, sort of path, things that are sort of under the hood and things that are sort of really generating customer facing value and uh, in those uh, in his sort of maps he analyzes that every time a technology moves into that space you need to build your application and value of your business uh, up in, in another layer so if VMs are not cool anymore you know just creating your VMs uh, you can just outsource them to the cloud that's probably the right thing to do when this technology uh, moves forward. Uh, same for, you know, we move to operating system instead of going and building our own operating system, we ask the cloud provider to just give us a machine with an Ubuntu, and it's going to move forward uh, into PaaS and serverless as one of those uh, incarnations. And this is really where the, the future is, is uh, leading to that platforms, PaaS, serverless, you know, Kelsey mentioned, you know, different things could be serverless, not just uh, Lambda functions but that's the general evolution. And, and if we're seeing, you know, one of the phenomena which is interesting when I speak to IT people, that's our cloud, you know. The VMs, hypervisors, VNIX, vSwitches. Uh, when you go to Amazon or Google, or you look at the Kelsey presentation, a cloud is something else. It's really focused on serverless, uh, mapping APIs, AI services, serverless functions, uh, DynamoDB, you know, Redshift. And, and I think people need to start thinking of, this is not something we need to reinvent. This is something we need to consume. And what we need to reinvent is more the business applications or some layers uh, and underneath that. And in some cases, we'll find that VMs, because we're moving the abstractions up, are now no longer uh, relevant. You know, there are a bunch of examples of people sort of ditching OpenStack or VMs and moving to bare metal Kubernetes. The other aspect is everyone thinks about the, the cloud as sort of, uh, you know, everyone needs to go to the cloud, but there are still a huge amount of workloads that have presence in multiple locations, whether it's uh, video cameras in uh, airports or, or buildings, whether it's uh, sensor data, IoT, automotive. Uh, so one of the things that we need to think about, even serving multiple geolocations with your applications around 24 uh, hours and 
sort of across the globe, uh, that means they need to also think about distribution, in some cases also edge computing. So those are the, the things that we need to think about uh, when we're thinking about our applications and all sort of leading towards uh, serverless as, <coughs> as the direction, as sort of the north. So uh, serverless is also, if you see that it's the focal point, point of the cloud providers because again, that's a way for you to leverage all those APIs that have been building and all those underlying services that they're building throughout the years in a sort of less friction it's also probably also a way for them to lock you into their platform, but that's a, sort of a, a nice side effect. And, and if you'll see, the, the things that they're starting to push is not just those Lambda functions. If you see Andy Jesse is also talking about Aurora, which is a database as a serverless, or uh, also you could see uh, Satya talking a lot about distributed and intelligent edge, which, by the way, we have a joint project with them on that. But now, uh, in, you know, everyone here probably could say, uh, we went to Lambda and I, I meet a lot of people say, yeah, we tried it and then we moved back to EC2 uh, because we thought that, yeah, serverless, we don't really need to do uh, much, but what we ended up is more something like that, you know? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we need to also think not just about the good things, about what we need to fix and what are the, the challenges. Uh, so I'll start with a few challenges. You know, one of the interesting things is that in the cloud native architecture, my workload is stateless. Uh, the challenge with my workload is stateless is that look at how many services a typical application depends on, anywhere from registries to file shares to SQL, NoSQL, uh, object, et cetera. So one of the things we need to think about and uh, standardize is also the, the notion of simplifying the access from those functions to, to the data and also doing it in a very uh, secure manner. And we'll see more and more uh, vendors working in, on that path. And the second thing that uh, I also wrote some posts about is, you know, one of the key challenges about those single threaded architectures like Lambda, uh, that your thread, you, you spend, you're paying Amazon for CPU time, uh, time memory for some process and that process happened to go to like an object store and just wait, uh, and you're, you're still paying that CPU uh, memory time uh, for it to retrieve something. So if we had a more asynchronous multi-threaded architecture, that means that for the same CPU and memory that I'm paying, I could actually do a lot more, uh, more work. So that's another thing that we're going to see in serverless architectures pretty much to what we've already done in, in Nucleo is more asynchronous, more multi-threading, uh, being able to address new applications. And, and also with that, we need to do some uh, more performance diagnostics to be able to identify those bottlenecks on our uh, frameworks. Uh, the next thing, and I think uh, the Lumigo guys had a presentation about uh, observability. Uh, the key challenge is that it's sort of a black box. The cloud provider packaged some nice container for us, and we need to trust it has uh, everything we need in there. And if there is a bug, we don't really no, because some of the bugs could be in our code, some of the bugs could be with a framework that calls uh, our code. So uh, what we will see, and uh, I think it was pretty cool what uh, Kelsey showed in the tracing for the Google Functions, uh, we'll see more introdu introduction of tracing capabilities, uh, counters, those are things that we're also uh, looking to add to uh, Nucleo, and some standardization around it that will allow third-party vendors of existing tools to plug into those frameworks uh, to essentially provide more instrumentations and performance monitoring. There are some standards, if you're familiar with CNCF, like Open Tracing and Jagger and all that, and I think we'll see more of those leading into uh, uh, serverless. Uh, another thing that uh, was mentioned, I think, a couple of times today was uh, all the event triggering of uh, functions. So the problem is that every vendor supports a certain uh, certain triggers, and even within the same vendor, the triggers would be, look pretty uh, different. So one of the efforts that we did as part of uh, this Cloud Native Foundation is standardize something called Cloud Event. We even did a nice uh, demo of all those different frameworks working against two cloud provider services and, uh, and all sort of uh, tweeting into uh, some response. So uh, one of the things is also that we're going to see standardization around events event semantics and uh, 
so that's another thing. Uh, what we also see more and more, and that's coming from sort of also my discussions with customers, uh, they're even becoming lazy of writing a function, you know, and because essentially many of those functions are very repetitive. You know, a function that reads from Kafka and writes to MongoDB, okay. So I essentially I need just two parameters, my MongoDB credentials and my Kafka credentials. So why should I write this function over and over? So uh, over time what we can see is that we're going to have application markets with templates. That's something that's already uh, planned for the coming, the next nuclear release, but I assume others will do that as well, is ability to do templating. And within your function spec, essentially specify which parameters need to, to be modified. And, and also we are, we'll see more and more vendors that try to build application markets around those uh, functions. So people can just say, you know what, this is a cool sentiment analysis uh, function. I'll just change my parameters. And maybe over time, even people will just start charging for invocation for some uh, IP. Could be a cool thing. Uh, Another thing that there is a lot of work on, also on the standardization side in CNCF, is uh, workflow uh, and pipelines for different serverless frameworks. And one of the things that uh, in CNCF we've taken one approach. If you looked at what Amazon did with Step Function, they did a nice move of open sourcing uh, the standard. So we'll see implementation either adopting this or the other, and also expanding it beyond serverless, because part of the, port, the thing is that serverless function may call an external service, or may be invoked by an external service. So another thing that we see in the, in the industry is focus uh, more and more on, uh, on workflows. And if you're interested, just uh, search in Google for uh, workflows, CNCF, you'll see some emerging standardization. Uh, the next thing that we see is uh, still, you know, you've seen most of the demos and it's like someone is editing code and pushing it, uh, but uh, more and more we'll, we'll see that things are moving into automated workflow. You know, the traditional write code pushed to uh, GitHub or a local Git uh, that wakes up Jenkins, you know, runs, store, deploys on a different cluster, further testing, eventually getting everything uh, productized. So uh, the first thing is getting enablers like we've done on, on GitHub integration, but others, I, I think others have it too. But then we'll see more and more people focus on doing the complete CI-CD uh, workflow with different serverless functions. Now beyond just thinking of a, of a function, the biggest challenge uh, of distribution and scale is that the same artifact may need to be populated, especially, for example, in IoT applications, to like a thousand or thousands of, of locations. So the nice thing about serverless, because it's a package, a package that contains code, uh, artifact, and specification, it can actually travel and just move to be populated in different locations, and maybe even get parameters from its environment. So maybe when it's in UK, you know, you change the language to England, and if it's in French, you change it to French or whatever. So that's uh, another thing that we're going to see as a trend. Uh, we've done some work around it. So uh, my only recommendation, you know, I didn't say everything is rosy, but technology has evolution. And this is another slide I really like from uh, Simon, you know, especially sort of uh, the last two, you know, many of you are sort of uh, enterprise IT, and it takes time to adopt new technology. So today it still sucks, you know, in some dimensions, uh, but in a year or two it's going to be really dominant. So we need to start adopting that technology so when it's really ripe for usage, then uh, we can leverage it.